What's up? What's up, everyone? Dr. Tamika here again. Welcome back to the Black Beauty Activist Podcast, where we discuss critical conversations to disrupt westernized beauty standards and raise the consciousness and confidence of the Black community. I'm your host, Dr. Tamika. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a scholar, empowerment speaker, and author. And on this platform, I discuss Black beauty and cultural truths that many of us don't want to talk about. In today's episode, we will be discussing a concept researchers call, researchers call the white gaze. If you are a person of color, there's a very good chance that you've experienced this. Perhaps you just didn't know what to call it or didn't have any words for it. And in today's episode, we're going to be breaking down this concept so that you can be better prepared and when situations arise when you might be experiencing the white gaze. I had the honor and heartbreak of being the first black professor of fashion at Kent State University. And I remember an uh, episode about 12 years ago when one of my colleagues and I were having a conversation and the conversation quickly took a turn. When she explained to me, you know, everybody in this department is scared of you. And I said in my mind, oh, here we go. I pulled myself together and I looked at her puzzled and I said, what do you mean scared of me? I'm the nicest person anybody would ever want to meet. Her response was, well, you're so aggressive. You speak up for yourself and you know we're all intimidated by you. And we know that you filed that affirmative action complaint against the fashion school. And if something's not going your way, you're going to go up the hill telling everybody. It took me everything not to give her something to be scared of. This is one of my most proudest professional moments because I could have easily gone off on her, but I didn't. And I quietly and quickly stated to her, well, if I didn't make the affirmative action complaint, would I be standing in front of you today? And as I said that, I quickly backed away and walked into my office. This experience is a result of what we know as the white gaze. And this is only one experience that I've had it throughout my career. There have been many more, but this is one that sticks out to me the most. To today's guest, um, I came across because I was writing an op-ed article and I was doing some research and found their work entitled Against a Sharp White Background, How Black Women Experience the White Gaze at Work. And I'll be sure to put the link uh, for their article in the description once this is all reported. But as I read this compelling piece of research, Moments in my life started flooding back to me. I began recalling experience after experience of dealing with what researchers call the white gaze. And what most experiences did to my thoughts, what those experiences did to my passion, my level of passion for the fashion industry, as well as what those experiences did to my self-confidence. And for a long time, I dealt with imposter syndrome and I left let my thoughts uh, beat me up. But once I found my purpose and I found my courage, the white gaze became my fuel. It set me on fire and I became the top researcher in that department. And as they say, the rest is history. And so I'm going to be bringing in the guest that I have today. Uh, it is my absolute honor to have with me today one of the authors, one of three authors of the research paper Against a White Sharp Background, How Black Women Experience the White Gaze at Work. Activists, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Courtney McClooney. And welcome to the Black Activist Podcast, Black Beauty Activist Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Tamika. I am so horrified, but also can completely relate to <laughs> the experiences that you've shared. Oh, horrified. No, you have no reason to be horrified. <sighs> the, when I read the paper, it was amazing. And um, it got me thinking. And like I said, a lot of the experiences that I dealt with as a black woman, a black woman in academia, a lot of those experiences came back to me, you know, because the research that you guys and we'll talk a little bit about that in some of the questions, but the research that you and your co-authors um, created was it, it spoke the truth. And that's what we all need is the truth. You know, so many of us don't want to talk about the truth. We try to hide it. And so this article definitely brought some truth to the surface. So I appreciate it. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. So Dr. Courtney L. McClooney, she, her, is an award-winning educator, researcher, consultant, and advisor. She is founder of Equal, Equal, is that how you pronounce it? Equal? E equity, actually. E like equity. E equity Well. Oh, yes. I love that. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Equity Well Partners, where she reimagines ways to foster equity and wellness. And oh, that's nice. That's nice. E equity and wellness in organizations. Her research on emotional tax and racial code switching has been featured in the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, the World Economic Forum, BBC, as well as NPR. Dr. Courtney has also published research in multiple academic journals and regularly joins business podcasts and conferences to share commentary on equity and justice work in work organizations. Trained as a social sci scientist, Dr. Courtney is a brilliant, I love that, honey, a brilliant PhD, first generation college graduate from High Point, North Carolina, who descended from enslaved Black people and disposed indigenous tribes. She is on the faculty at Cornell University School at ILR. What does ILR stand for? School of Industrial and Labor Relations. Okay, School of Industrial and Labor Relations School and Research Director with Loom, the Cultural, the Cultural Map, Inc. Dr. Courtney completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia and earned her PhD in psychology at the University of Michigan and a BA in psychology and interpersonal organizational communications at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. She is a former research fellow at Catalyst Inc. and previously served as an AmeriCorps social impact fellow. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to have her here. I mean, you just got started, young lady. I just, <laughs> you just got started and you have all of these accolades. So just think about what your career, like the next time we talk, 10 years from now, <laughs> think about what this bio is going to look like. Blows my mind every time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You should be very, very proud. Thank you. And so we're going to jump right on in into these questions. All right. And so how did you all decide to come up with this project? Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, Dr. Courtney uh, published the um the research article that I came across that I absolutely loved. She pu published that piece of work with two other co-authors. And so how did you all come up with this project? Yes, thank you so much for the question. So the co-authors include Dr. Veronica Rabello, who is an assistant professor at San Francisco State University, and Dr. Katharina Robotham, who's a researcher fellow at uh, Catalyst. Yeah. And we all are graduate students together at the University of Michigan in psychology. Uh, broadly studying workplace harassment experiences of all women, but we all had a particular interest in understanding the unique experiences of Black and Latinx and uh, other women of color who and their, what type of harassment experiences they might be having at work. Uh, we we're also very active on social media. We, you know, are part of the millennial generation. I realized I'm an OG Twitter user <laughs> a couple years ago. Um, and I remember scrolling on Twitter the same day that April Ryan was publicly scolded in the White House press floor uh, by then um, Spicer, I believe, was the chief of staff mm. for the Trump administration. Uh, the same day that um, uh, Councilwoman Maxine Waters was also publicly criticized by a political pundit talking about their hair, their facial yeah. There was yeah. just a lot of negativity directed at these Black women for, in our opinion, being Black women. Yeah. And activist Brittany Packnett Cunningham tweeted and said, you know what? Let's do this. These women are not alone in their, in their experience of being publicly chastised for breathing while Black <laughs> and then looking for <laughs> do every day. So share your Maxine and April moments with this hashtag Black Women at Work. Mm. As an organizational scholar and researcher, I was really excited to see from the ground up this uh, desire and focus on the unique experiences that Black women are having in the workplace and something that is generated in a public domain like Twitter. Yeah. Um, how that was an opportunity at the time to think about big data, what do viral hashtags look like, and how can that be used for uh, research purposes to deepen our understanding of what the workplace is like and how Black women are being forced to navigate those spaces. Mm. 
Um, so there was, it was a really fascinating journey, actually. We learned a lot about how to actually download and analyze big data like tweets and texts, yeah. and wade through a lot of bots and some mm-hmm. horrific messages, um, but also mm. get these, these stories of Black women and be able to piece them together and connect with folks like yourself and like yeah. us who were having these same experiences and seeing that we can relate to someone who's in a completely different setting or life stage than we are, but are nonetheless being seen through what we discovered in our research as through a distorted lens of whiteness. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I truly believe that if you are a person of color and you work in a predominantly white space, there is almost a certainty that you've experienced some type of white gaze moment in your career. You know, um, some of us, like I said, we just don't know what to call it. Okay. Sometimes, um, sometimes we just, we don't know, you know, we just don't know how to react to it because sometimes it catches us off guard depending on, you know, how, uh, how avert, you know, mm-hmm. this particular um, experience might be for us. But we, I believe we've all experienced some sort of uh, white gaze moment in our careers. We've also seen it on public display in the past few hours, uh, weeks, months, <laughs> I think a lot about Angel Reese and wow. the reaction to her being a competitive athlete and the physical gestures that she's made um, and how there was such a different media reaction and fan reaction to her making the exact same gesture as a white woman competitive athlete. And that is an example of how we we are distorting uh, the views of Black women and labeling them in ways that are deficit focused and negative and meant to show how she is so unlike this other player who we would prefer to behave in this manner. Mm. Um, and and I, I unfortunately, yeah, I think that is way too common in all of our work spaces. Um, Absolutely. What comes to mind is, um, as you were talking about that, is the situation that happened with Serena Williams, remember? Yes. Yeah, at the French Open. And, you know, one of the things I talk about in my research quite often is how, you know, we have been animalized in that particular space. um, She became this animalized character. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the um, I don't know if you saw there was a character drawn up about her. Remember? Mm-hmm. where they had her like jumping up and down like some mm-hmm. kind of animal, right? Mm-hmm. And so, and the only thing she was doing was standing up for herself, right? And right. so, yeah, we, we have all in some ways, shape or form, experienced this white gaze. Uh, please explain, we've been talking about this, so please explain exactly what the white gaze is for those that don't understand or perhaps may have heard this term for the first time. Yes. So the way that we define the white gaze is essentially seeing the world and everything in it and everyone in it through a lens of whiteness. And whiteness is so invisibilized that the way that Zora Neale Hurston described it is a white background. That Mm -hmm. is, I think it's pervasive. It is the water we're swimming in. It is something that has always been present, but is rarely named. So Mm -hmm. that is why we have those feelings when we are thrown and thrust against a white background we are unsure what might have caused this reaction to our human experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and why is it that we are somehow not meeting the correct rules or operating in the way that we think we should be or not staying in our place? And we'll talk about staying. Absolutely. In absolutely. Um, yeah. And seeing the whole world through whiteness also, I think, on a practical level, looks like thinking that everything that is associated with whiteness is right, is normal, is the way that everyone should be behaving. Uh, it's a way of evaluating a culture or a society. How safe is it? How clean is mm, it? Mm. All these, uh, you know, again, unspoken norms and labels that we apply. It's also a structure of advantage. Uh, whiteness was defined in the U.S., for example, by who was able to own property. Absolutely. Back allowing white men to go kill and rape and murder indigenous tribes and claim land with the Homestead Act. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was only given to white men. It was not given to everyone else. And so that absolutely policy that came into place to even define what whiteness meant. Absolutely. Um, it's evaluated to that standard. Who's allowed to vote? Who's allowed to run for office? Who's allowed to serve on a jury? Who's allowed to bring a case against another person? It all starts to define what it means to be white. And so to be seen through a white gaze is to be seen through that lens. Uh, through mm-hmm. that lens of this is what we think of as an ideal society, an ideal person, an ideal worker. And if you're deviating outside of that, uh, then somehow you are not 
quite the right fit or perhaps yeah. not well suited for this position. Right. Either you're invisible or either you're hyper visible. Yes, exactly. That reminds mm -hmm. me of another paper that Dr. Yeah. Bell and I wrote. <laughs> yeah. Um, the visibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah the absolutely. Visibility. And um, I was actually just having this conversation with, I have a 10 year old son okay. and he brought home some homework and his homework was talking about uh, women's history month. And one of the um, questions that he had on the, on the homework was talking about 1929 was when all women were allowed to vote. And, and I told my son, I said, well, you know, baby, I said, this is not all the way correct. Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, what do you mean? He was like, that's what it says. I said, that's not true. I said, all white women were allowed to vote, but black women like mommy, I was still not allowed to vote. Black men like daddy, we, he, he was not allowed to vote. And so I wrote a letter, like a little sticky note. I put it on his homework and I asked his teacher, please tell the, the whole truth about everything. She didn't respond to me, oh. but I still needed to let my son know that this is not 100% correct. Thank goodness for you, because our education system, as we see in this country, is actively trying to continue to keep whiteness in the background. Absolutely. And not point out all the various ways that it is currently operating and always operating, especially in education, our workplaces, our criminal justice system. Not yeah. even that word shouldn't even be part of it. Yeah. Our criminal incarceration system yeah. and various other systems we have in place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you speak on what exactly the white gaze, um, how it shows up for women of color? Um, what have you guys found? Um, what, we're talking about black women today, but this is something that will affect most women of color. So other women of color, like how have you all, because you were mentioning the fact that you were looking at brown women as well. Mm -hmm. So like, what are some experiences that you've heard of um, that other women of color have dealt with, with the white gaze? Yes. And I'll, I'll talk about, you know, the various ways that we saw the white gay showing up at work and just give some examples of how yeah. to different groups. Um, so in the paper, we identified four main ways that whiteness is, uh, the white gaze is operating in organizations. One of those, for example, is that is, it is imposed on everyone else. Mm. And by being imposed, it's assuming that white norms are the standard and everyone should meet that. That mm. looks like emotional display rules. So again, we, be, we believe that politeness and holding your tongue and avoiding conflict, those are elements of white supremacy culture. So when a Black woman is rightfully disgruntled or angry, it, it goes too far. And all of a sudden, yeah. you are violating the display rules. Uh, what that can look like for Latina women is very similar. There is all these stereotypes about uh, being a feisty Latina woman yeah. or yeah. Dragon, tiger lady when it comes to Asian women. Um, mm, there are mm. also various ways that whiteness has been valued or, or valorized and idolized at work. And so they create some essentialist beliefs. And that's when we hear statements like, oh, you're not like other insert your racial group that exists here. Oh my word. Sound oh. to how you, and it, it, it does not, it fails to acknowledge all the reasons why, for example, people who are immigrants to the US or to any Western society, forced immigration. And I, and I think of force in so many layers. Like when you go yeah. to history and you excavate all of its resources and you force them to come to your the country in order to make ends meet and to receive higher education. To me, that's forced immigration, but anyway. Um, Having to learn English is such a huge barrier to what resources you're allowed to access. Yeah. Um, I think about this specifically with um, a lot of people who English is not their first language, which tends to be a lot of uh, East Asian and well, a Asian folks in general, and but especially uh, people coming from South America, Central America, et cetera. Um, so valorizing how well they can speak English refuses to acknowledge, first of all, that people have been in this country for centuries. <laughs> um, so learning English is not something that is just uniquely white. Um, right. Second of all, people have gone through such uh, rigorous whitewashing of their entire selves, their culture, how they speak, mm -hmm. how they speak in order just to make it and yeah. then do this compared to someone who is way less qualified than them, who's allowed to walk through doors just because they remind the person in charge of themselves or of their yeah. And we know that we don't have that same connection. So we're having yeah. to double, triple the work uh, to sound and look how we think that this, this group that's constantly mm -hmm. in positions of power want us to look and sound. Yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness. And we were, you were just mentioning um, about work. And so 
uh, how has the history of black women's labor mm -hmm. affected their treatment in organizations today? Uh, this makes me think about research by uh, doctors Nikhil Buchanan and Isis Settles um, and Zajay Harrell. These were a fantastic group of black women uh, psychologists, and they were some of the first to document the unique forms of harassment, for example, that mm. Black women are exposed mm. to. Mm. Um, and it's almost always dealing with their physical bodies, whether it's the physical assault level of harassment, or is it? it's just the commenting and the over over-policing of Black women's bodies in, in whatever space. We talked about this with Serena. There was nothing she could wear that was right, right? Because mm -hmm. Day, what they wanted to say is your body does not fit our idea of what a tennis woman should look like. Yeah. Um, and I think about in our data and even the story you shared, there's over policing of just black women's features in general. One of the women said that her colleagues told her her lips are too big to wear lipstick. At oh, work. wow. Like your lips are too big for lipstick. And this is coming, uh, these comments are coming out at the same time that we see an industry exploding of lip fillers and of uh, people wanting features of black women all on their bodies. Well, now we're going in the reverse. Everyone's wanting the slim body now uh, and they no longer want the BBLs. Um, but <laughs> that, that choice, you know, oh my gosh. <laughs> black and brown women have, a, yeah, when we talk about beauty, right? We talk about those beauty standards. Um, telling someone hair texture, for example, yeah. I has been called distracting uh, because of how it grows naturally out of my head. Um, every time I wear braids, the, the very first time that I realized my braids had not been touched at work was when the pandemic started and I was working from home. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. School, working in you know nonprofits, working in healthcare spaces. It didn't matter. If I had braids, I could feel a tug on the back of my hair everywhere I went. That is harassment. Absolutely. And when I think about the history of our ancestors, especially in this country, black women's body. Girl, I, would have, I would have loved to have been there when that happened. Oh, girl. Um, oh, and, my gosh. And, and like you were saying earlier, too, it's a shock when it, it happens. It is a shock. It is a shock. I think my I think my brain goes into the first of all, I learned not to touch somebody in kindergarten. Like you right. know, first of all, second of all. Why are you touching me? You don't know where I've been. That's nasty. That's hygiene. <laughs> when COVID was spreading and they had to teach people how to wash their hands again, I was like, this is the same people that be grabbing people's hair without their permission um, because you just touch it. Like, yeah. It made me think about the zoos of mm. Black people, uh, Black people specifically from Congo or Western Central Africa being placed in zoos. Absolutely. Uh, about hot and hot Venus. Uh, Absolutely being traveled and par paraded around the world for her body to be on display and poked and prodded and touched. And prostituted. Even beyond life itself. Right. Her death right. did not end the gazing at her body, right? Um, the and if, for, if, for those of you that have not heard about the story of Venus Hot and Tot, you need to find that story. Her name is uh, Sarah Bartman is what they were saying that her name was. Um, if you um, want to hear a miraculous story, uh, listen to her story. It is truly, truly uh, a miraculous. And like Dr. Courtney was saying, that even after her death, her body was still on display. Right. For a long, long a time. long, long time. Yeah, absolutely. I think too about, you know, even the field of gynecology being founded on the backs of Black enslaved women. Um, absolutely. So we name it after the white men who explored the uterus through not it providing anesthesia and he could do whatever he want because this was his property. Black women were his property. And I, and I think, I think that same mindset lingers at oh, work. Yeah. Today. I think the ways it manifests too are things like if I do demand any sort of respect, whether that's pay or time or bodily autonomy or the right to just wear my hair the way I want it or yeah. to make a face in however I want to wear my face. Yeah. Um, there is a immediate, how dare you? Mm -hmm. Or you should be grateful to even be here. So what do you wow. mean we're not paying you enough? What do you mean? Like there's Ooh, a, a backlash to us demanding to be treated like humans because that belief that we are human is counter to what it means to be white. Whiteness was in itself is defined as anti-Black and anti-Blackness is the denial of our humanity. Um, oh, that was deep right that. there. Did you guys just hear that? Can you repeat that, Dr. Courtney? Yes. 
whiteness is defined as being anti-black and anti-blackness is to deny our humanity. Mm. And I think what that Ooh. looks like at the highest level is we have every right to go into, go onto the continent of Africa, carve it up how we want, claim this country is mine, this country is mine. Everyone talks about Hitler being the most horrific genocidal person has never, must have never heard of King Leopold. Hey. He saw the Congo as his backyard mm-hmm. and he did whatever he wanted to those people. And that practice of doing whatever we want to Central and Sub-Saharan Africa continues to this day, taking all the resources, not ensuring that the infrastructure and that there is choice and who they want to work with, how they want to work, the conditions of these mining practices that fuel all of our technologies. Yeah. It, is, it is a societal dehumanization of Blackness. And I think what that looks like at the most bottom interpersonal level is touching me without my permission and thinking that there's nothing wrong with that or that I should just be okay with it. Um, And I even think about the various ways that black women, other women of color have just internalized the white gaze. They've just learned how to play the rules. I remember seeing that viral video of a black woman standing in Times Square. Well, you can touch my hair if you want to. And- Talking about the um, the, the, the project, it was, um, it was done, that project was done by an organization called Unruly. Yeah. And, and so they, they made the uh, short documentary about mm-hmm. you can touch my hair. And the way in which they framed it was that this was an educational experience. Right. You know, um, <laughs> there was a lot of controversy around mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, I, you know, in many ways, I think their intentions were good. Of course. You know, the intentions were good because what they're, in my opinion, what they were trying to do is they were trying to find ways to kind of get rid of discrimination in some ways. You know, by allowing people to, and I truly believe that the only reason why we still have discrimination is because we don't understand each other. You know, mm. we don't understand each other. And so they were trying to allow people the space to ask questions and to better understand black people, black women in particular. Yeah. But it was met with some, it was, it was, that was a rough one because there were a lot of women that were upset about it. Of course, I was one of those women who was upset about it. I personally don't believe we can empathy our way out of structural discrimination. And I'm glad that you share that they were trying to get people to learn about each other. But I was like, I think especially groups that are dominant and dominant groups, and it's not just whiteness. I think whiteness is one of the biggest ones. Um, you got to spend more time learning about yourself, learn your own history, and you will come to that why the rest of us are reacting the way we are uh, to your own history. But there, there's also active work against teaching uh, white people their own history uh, because they know it's going to surface a lot of questions, controversy, backlash. Uh, I know whenever, for example, we bring up the desire for reparations in this country and, oh, and yeah. policies around it, that the immediate reaction is, well, I didn't own enslaved people. I'm like, well, let's yeah. look at the deeds of your house and let's look at the deeds of that person's house. And if we go back far enough, which is not that far, my oh, grandpa right. is still around and his grandpa was enslaved. It right. is not that far. Right. We will find it. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's not like we have to go digging so far. It, there are practices like that happening now where they were um, in Europe, they're linking the, the ships that carried the kidnapped and tortured and enslaved ancestors of Black people to current modern day businesses today. There, there is a clear linkage, like your company's first million came from these ships that were transporting our people. Reparations, like, like you can easily tie it together, but there's no desire to do that because yeah, I, I do think sometimes we over lean into the empathy and not enough into the internal investigations. Mm. Yeah, we know. Wow. Yeah. It's so deep. Wow. How do you think the white gaze or how, how, how has the research shown that the white gaze impacts the, the self-confidence of Black women? Yeah. Going back to the beauty standards piece. Absolutely. Yeah. I especially think this is so relevant for your podcast. Yeah. How on earth do I get ready in the morning when mm. I know that I'm on this, I'm either hyper visible, like you said, or invisible. Preparing for a day like that is psychologically damaging. I think of it as spirit killing. It's it's soul crushing, right? Um, so on the one hand, you want to be seen for your contributions. You want to be acknowledged for the hard work that you are putting in. 
and you want to try to minimize perhaps all the things that could be distracting. Ah. Um, what does that look like when you're in a body that is dark skin, when you are in a body that is fat, when you are in a body that has a disability, when you are in a body that has kinky 4C hair? What does it look like to remove those distractions so that the only thing that's coming out of your mouth is the contributions of your work and you're being credited for that? It looks like assimilation. That's what it looks like. There you go. Yes. Assimilation. And and that erodes your self-confidence because the simulation says, well, everything about you as it currently is, is wrong. So in order to get, get ready for your day, you need to assimilate. You need to get that uh, rhinoplasty done to get your nose a little bit smaller. You need to get that skin lightening cream, get your skin a little bit lighter. Fix that accent, girl. Fix that tone. Don't use that AAVE unless they are willing to key key with you. Use it inappropriately when they use it now. Don't do it like that on a regular basis. I study code switching too. Like that's my other big area of research. And that has if you guys don't know AAVE, that's the African American yes. vernacular English. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh -huh. Also called Gen Z speak. I'm like, that's not no damn. <laughs> 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 Everything black. It becomes everybody else's culture. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. How is wow, that wow. refreshing, right? So like, mm. and, and like, don't get me wrong, caring for black hair in whatever way you decide to do it is expensive. It's a whole industry around it. Um, but I am only not even a full decade removed from getting relaxers. Yeah. And we now know that that extreme form of assimilation of chemically putting products in your hair to straighten it has been linked to things like uterine cancer and breast cancer. So Absolutely. when we're thinking about the cost of, if I don't straighten my hair, I don't get this job. If I do straighten my hair, I get cancer. What, come on, come on. Like, what, what are we doing? Like, what, what kind of society have we created where those are the choices that black women are presented with? Well, see, part of the issue is that most black people are not, as you mentioned, self-aware. Yeah. Um, we're still very much brainwashed in lots of ways. And yeah. so we don't see that we're assimilating. Yeah. We just see that this is what we do. This is how we wear our hair. Um, this is what we traditionally, this is how my mother did it. You know, um, as we know, when young girls get to a certain age, it's like a rites of passage to straighten your hair. Right. Yeah. And so it's, it's a tradition, quote unquote. Right. Yeah. And so when, uh, when people have, uh, a situation where they're thinking about becoming natural. Yeah. It's almost like they're relearning themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It they was, have, yeah, they have to relearn themselves. It was such a process for me. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm seeing new generations of black women and girls not going through that. And that is so exciting. I want to yeah. shout out my brilliant hairstylist, Dianelle McAllister, D Simone artistry in Northern New Jersey. That is an entire natural hair salon that is centered around Black women's comfort, luxury, and professionalism. Mm. And when I tell you, non-Black women come too, so it's not like it's an exclusive Black women-only space, but best believe we are listening to house Black women house music. If you haven't heard Aretha Franklin and Patti LaBelle's house music, uh, <laughs> right? Um, we are listening to old school R&B. We got our incense going. We have plants. Nice. There. See these nice. young girls. Like I'm having picture day. And okay, girl, what kind of braids you want? And I was like, oh my God. Like, yes, braids for picture day. Like <laughs> I remember picture day. I'm getting up at the crack of dawn. Yeah. To fry my hair. And, and Shirley Temple yeah. curls. Oh, God. oh my God. I had the French roll bun with the curls coming out the top in fourth grade. Way too... I'm way too young for this hair. <laughs> <Wow. laughs> <laughs> um, and and I, I just, I feel like overwhelmed with joy when I see these young girls loving their looks and they have role models like Halle Bailey now as their yes. little mermaid, like locks is a yes. beautiful Disney princess. Oh my gosh. I was like, that, they don't, I don't know mm. if realize how big a deal that is like yeah well I mean as you know she experienced the white gaze and that yeah that, that hashtag not my aerial episode was absolutely ridiculous mermaids can't be black it's it's not even <laughs> <laughs> it's oh my gosh people go so far
<laughs> so I mean, far. oh my gosh. Well, I mean, this answers my next question because, you know, looking at how the white gaze affects black beauty and we're talking about it, like, you know, it affects so much about ourselves and how we, um, and how we live our lives, the choices that we decide to make about, you know, mm -hmm. how we look, because as you said, we don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we're, uh, we're looking appropriate so that we can get that, that job interview or that we can get that promotion. And so many of us, are, the psychological um, tension and stress that goes on with that, you know, having to think about, okay, if I am natural, I got to make sure that I straighten my hair for my job interview. And I've had several conversations with women who say, well, I'm not going to show my, my natural hair until I actually get the job. Yep. Yep. We, we know the barriers and know the costs. And unfortunately, there is research to back that up. Oh, Ashley my Rosette. research. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Ashley Rosette too, Christy Cabal, yes. uh, the late, great Kathy Phillips and Tina Opie. And even in our research, Black women are penalized for having natural hair in the job interview stage. And in our study, we even found a white woman said, black hair, nappy hair doesn't belong in the workplace. That, that was a verbatim comment from our research. It's like, nappy hair does not belong in the workplace. Um, it's not professional. And, and I think like what you're getting at, and especially, especially when it comes to work and beauty, professionalism standards continue to guide a lot of workplaces. And even when I do work with organizations now, um, a lot of them have never revisited their grooming policies. Yeah. And even though there are a lot of things unsaid, it's, it'll say things like come to hit, come to uh, work with your hair in a professional style. Your hair should not be unkempt. Who gets to interpret what that means? Means, yeah. yeah. Shouldn't unkempt be wet, wet hair in a little bun? Um, right. Shouldn't unkempt <laughs> be... Right, right. Like, what do you mean by unkempt? Um it's still legal in so many states in this country to fire someone for having unprofessional, unkempt hair as defined by the employer. Um, I think the latest, yeah, the latest case was probably at Zara, this retail store that typically appeals to um, more, I guess, like economically advanced people. Um, but they fired a black woman for having straight hair in the interview, but came to the job with her natural hair. And I was like, oh no, that hair is not appropriate for our clientele. It's not the type of image we're trying to purvey. And I just think about how this goes from hair to lips to even how we sound, right? Like so much Absolutely. of our work is moving towards the digital space. We're not actually gonna be face-to-face -face anymore. At most you might hear my voice. And there's accent bias that affects I think a lot of non-white people, but even for white people, Southerners. Yeah. And yeah. Education, right? Like you are all, everyone's going to be impacted by this white gaze, including white people. And I don't know mm. if you understand that. Wow. Too. This is wow. not what you continue to uphold because at one day you're going to be older. You're going to have disabilities forming. Mm -hmm. Holding up this, there, there are some really interesting findings. Um, of research on content warning suicide. Mm. Uh, suicide has been rising in communities of color. Um, and for a lot of white folks, it tends to stay relatively normal. Uh, and normal meaning like not necessarily higher or lower than any other particular group until white men hit about 50 and 60 years old. And all of a sudden there's a spike really? in suicide attempts. And I had to think about this thing. I was like, what is happening? to white men around 50 and 60. That image of perfection, phys physical healthiness, your body is starting to change in your 50s and 60s. Whether you've been super healthy your whole life or not, our bodies are not you know, infinite. They, mm -hmm. are, they are finite and our bones start changing. Cognition starts changing. And all of a sudden it goes against everything you've been taught about what an ideal person is. That's why I want all of us to be against things like white supremacy and and uh, imposing whiteness on everyone at work because even you're going to be beyond the frame of whiteness over time. We see this a lot in tech, for example, mm. where it's hard to get hired in tech if you're above 45, regardless, mm. Of, mm. regardless of your race, uh, because well, we assume tech is associated with youth. 
Yeah. Um, then the exact opposite things happen in spaces like education, where too young, you don't know enough to to be a principal, to be a mm-hmm. first professor. Um, I got told so many times, like, you look so young to be a professor. Um, and even going back to, you know, the beauty at work and trying to think about what I even wear on a day-to-day basis. Um, I don't know if you've ever gotten this in the classroom, but those end of year student evaluations every year, I like when she wears this dress. Dr. Courtney looks so great in yellow. Um, that oh yeah, no, no, it's, it's just, on the evaluation. Are you kidding me? It's like how has Dr. McClendon enhanced your learning? <laughs> she she looks great. <laughs> what like every year, every year, comments about what I look like. Mm. You know what, sweetheart? I got to a point in my academic career where I stopped list. I stopped reading the comments. Had to stop. I don't even, I, I, I stopped reading them because they were ridiculous. Um, the day that I stopped reading those comments is when one of my students told me that Dr. Tamika Ellington is a racist, that she only likes the black students in our class. And there was only two black people in the class. <laughs> and you're telling me that I'm ignoring everybody else. Oh my God. Except for these two black people in our class. Whew. Yeah. So after that day, I promised myself I would never read another student evaluation in my life. No, it's never. Mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> it's, it's not worth it. But, you know, you were just talking about your experience uh, with the white gaze. Yeah. Um, what was the most what can you say was the, like the most memorable experience? Like um, I was just talking about earlier, my most memorable experience is when my colleague told me to my face that everybody in the department was scared of me. Yeah. I, this may surprise you, Dr. Shamika, but I have a very similar experience. I'm not and, surprised. I'm yeah, not surprised. I was, I was very junior in my career. Um, so I won't say which school I was, I was affiliated with, but I'm working with um, everyone who I was working with was ahead of me in terms of the career trajectory and, and getting mm-hmm. tenure and things like that. I'm the only one that's not having tenure in this, this group that I'm working with. And I'm leading a project. I developed a plan for how we could go about leading this work. Just the plan. I didn't execute it. I just designed it, shared it with everyone. And the very first reaction to the plan from the most senior person in the room was, this is intimidating. Let's make sure we don't share this with other people because they will be intimidated by this, that thing that you've put together. And my brain went, in so many directions. My body almost went to fight or flight mode. It was like, Mm -hmm. what on earth do you mean by that? I I didn't even have the words, like you said, to, uh, I think my face just was one of bewilderment. Like, is this feedback? I I don't, I don't know what you mean. Um, and, and later on, I met with the other folks who would be working on the plan and was like, Hey, what were your thoughts about this plan? It was so thorough. It was so helpful. It was a great guide. So where on earth is this intimidation comment coming from? And that's when I realized, like, just because someone's further ahead than you, that does not mean that they are not threatened by your brilliance. This is why I use terms like brilliance now. Clearly, it's brilliance. It is the inability to dull this light that is forever going to shine for me. Um, And it reminds me a lot of Dr. Keisha Thomas's pet to threat theory. Mm, I need to look at that pet to threat. Pet to threat theory. It is, it describes, I think, so many women of color, but especially black women. Doctor, what's her name? Dr. Keisha, K-E-C-I-A, Thomas. Uh, Keisha Thomas is a brilliant black woman organizational psychologist um, at the University of Georgia. And this theory, it essentially describes the various treatment that black women receive throughout their careers, where they start usually as a workplace pet Even going back to some of your comments you were making about, you know, the animal treatment. But Mm -hmm. oh, we have Dr. Courtney here now. Isn't she so cute in her little professor clothes? And oh, we love how the students love how down you are. You understand, da da da. And as soon as I do something great, I get a paper published calling out whiteness, (laughs) whatever it is. Next thing you know, well, we didn't think you deserved this award because you know you you win too much already, right? It's like it's that it's that Beyonce treatment of the Grammys, right? It's like you're qualified, but you don't deserve it because it's gonna make everybody else feel bad. Or we're intimidated by you, or we're scared of you. That's that threat response. 
what do you do when you're threatened? You get rid of the threat or you exhibit fear. So every mm -hmm. time there's a fear-based comment directed towards me, I'm like, oh, I've, I've reached the threat territory. <laughs> like I was in the pet stage, but as soon as I started to flex my brilliance, yeah. do my yep. actual job. And, and I think yep. I'm always... I'm always flabbergasted that people are surprised at how brilliant we are because I'm like, Ooh. you not realize we've had to actively work against the systems you put in place for us not to survive and to thrive. So if I'm here next to you, please know my muscles have had to go through a little bit more work to get here. So don't yeah. be surprised when I flex them and when <laughs> the brilliance comes out because do you know the hoops I had to jump through to get mm -hmm. here and seriously to... Um, you know, one of the comments that I hate the most. Oh, I know what you're about to say. <laughs> one of the comments I hate the most is when people tell me, oh, you're so articulate. I knew it. <laughs> I'm like, what else did you expect from a Black woman? Yes. Who is highly educated. Yes. You. What yes. did you expect? Every time I present at a conference, someone tells me that. It's like, oh, and really? there's like, like what? Someone told my mentor who Dr. Enrique Nedla is one of the foremost black child adolescent psychologists today, like okay. creme de la creme. And he is giving the keynote lecture of a public health conference. And someone comes up to him immediately afterwards and was like, I was just so amazed at how articulate you are. I was like, oh my God. I was like, oh my God, this is, this is the keynote. <laughs> what? But, oh. I'm just, I'm like, oh, I, I, I've, I've gotten to a point where I am so open about it. And I will say to someone, what, what else you did you expect? No. What else did you doing expect? That. I got to start doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, Cause they will, you know, they will keep on at it. They will keep at it. You know, um, and it's 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 an ever ending cycle. I mean, it's it's a never ending cycle. But I want to find out how can we make some transformational change. This white gaze is not going anywhere anytime soon. And so, what are some coping mechanisms that Black women can develop within themselves to excel? Like, what are some things that we can offer <coughs> Black women that can help them manage and and excel through? Yeah. these uh, situations of white gaze. Yeah, I think there's been so many amazing conversations and communities created in response to, or not just in response to, but in a desire to create safe spaces and work for Black women. I'm thinking about the Therapy for Black Girls work mm. and movements, yeah. right? The uh, yeah. Resistance Manifesto. It's just all yeah. of these reminders to really love and appreciate and deepen our you know, sense of self and our love for ourselves in general. Uh, but at the same time, we, I'm not going to tell everybody to quit their jobs, but <laughs> I do want us to figure out ways to work and exist and live beyond the white gaze uh, to the extent that we can. Super challenging, as you mentioned, it, it is like pervasive and everywhere, but I think it does require like reconnecting back to our communities mm -hmm. and allowing us to have a community first mindset, even when it comes to our individual pursuits and work, um, yeah. so thinking about my own comfort or discomfort with negotiating salary, for instance. If oh, I have a really? mindset, 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 it's not just me I'm negotiating for. It's all Black women. I need to let them Absolutely. know this is not okay to do to any Black woman, not just yeah. me. Um, yeah. so I take that mindset with me that I am with my sisters. I am doing this with Black women. We have a desire to, for example, uh, this is Black Maternity Health Week coming up. Mm. everyone should be outraged at the treatments of black women in medical spaces. And the fact that so many of us are dying from childbirth, there was just yet another black woman who died after giving birth in Detroit this past week. And the fact that workplaces uh, especially are not trying to provide adequate health care and expansive health care so we can have access to black doctors. The fact that medical schools are not trying to expand their ranks to increase more black doctors. Like this should be at the forefront of everyone's conversation. And then by everyone, I don't mean just black women. I mean like everyone. Everybody. Else. Yeah. Um, but I do keep that community first mindset with myself, with how I navigate work, negotiate work. And I think things like that helps me to show up as my 
whole black woman self in the workplace. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. If I start assimilating and changing, I am making it more difficult for any black woman that comes after me mm -hmm. that's currently here because they will look at everyone else like, well, you can just assimilate. Dr. McClooney's doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Change your Absolutely. Head. It's Absolutely. Really I was like, no, no, we're in this together. And when yeah. we're building solidarity around our togetherness, we can continue to uplift others. And think about the various ways we bring privilege into those spaces. I want to advocate more on behalf of more darker skinned women, on behalf of fat Black women, on behalf of Black women who are trans and who are disabilities. They are having acute, uh, horrific issues as well. And how can we all be, be in on the same side of this in terms of advocating for all Black women to thrive? Um, you know what's so interesting as you were speaking, I, I apologize for cutting okay. you off, but what you were just saying about assimilating, one thing that I have noticed is that the experience that Black women who decide to choose to assimilate and ones who do not choose to assimilate, their 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 experiences is very different. Yes. They have a different experience. Yes. It's almost like they're 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 not really black people, you know, because they go along with everything that's happening. Their experience is totally different. They don't get the same pushback, yeah. you know, that people who are more self-aware, more culturally, culturally conscious, they don't get that same experience. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really interesting to me. So it's almost like our authenticity is a, is a um, punishment. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, ignorance is bliss, right? Mm -hmm. It's, like, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. when you're intentionally, you know, um, <laughs> I can't see me. I'm still thinking about <laughs> <Adrian>. um, <laughs> It's bliss when you get to uh, try to exist raceless in a world that is so yeah. clearly racialized and structured. Yep way um so it's, it's certainly a balancing act of being aware having that authenticity but also having all the tools and resources available to like you said cope but also to figure out ways of thriving i have found personally that a lot of somatic healing practices like meditation and breath yes. yoga yes. i am and just so grateful for the increasing number of communities of Black people and Black women, especially in those spaces. Yes. I look into yes. Layla Delia almost every morning while I'm doing meditations and doing uh, yoga with Bright and Salted Yoga on YouTube. I love her. I love her. Yes, I, I love, love her. her. Yeah. Um, and just, again, constantly absorbing all the works that's written by Black women and being in community with them. Like you're, you're writing, writing yeah. is a spiritual practice because it keeps yeah. us honest. It keeps us telling the truth. Um, and I, I enjoy engaging in those work as well, along with aligning and advocating for our sisters, you know, and, and Black women's overall wholeness. Um, yeah. We have the right to be us in our day-to-day -day life. We have our we have a right to embrace our whole selves. And how do we live like as if this is our right? That's what I want to start exploring more. Like, what does that look like to live as if this is our rights. It live. looks like courage. It looks like courage. Mm -hmm. It looks like I'm a fearless individual. Yes. That's what it looks like because assimilation in my mind is only, it's a response to fear. Yes. That's, That's what assimilation say. is. It's, it's a response to fear. Yes. I That's fear that if I don't do these things that they are telling me to do, that I won't get ahead. Right. That's a great point. I mm -hmm. love that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's also such an abundant mindset thinking, right? Like some of my favorite, um, and not even just favorite, but some of the Black women I deeply admire, they've never not centered Black womanness in what they're doing. I remember at several points in my career, I was told like, you have Black in too many of your paper titles. Might be one, take that out. That is not, I have to decide. <laughs> Listen, I have not, I have never published, I have never published with my oh academic Oh my God. I've never published an academic research with a white man and a white man pointed that out. And I, I said, can I see your CV? Because I don't know if you've ever published with a black woman, but they will say, oh, because there's not that many of you. There's more of us. So that means you're intentionally going out of your way to not publish with us. Like that, that is the response I've gotten from my work before. Oh yeah. It's like, oh, you don't, you don't publish with us. Um, and I had to decide. And this is when I'm, again, super junior it, to have a certain type of career. I need to be, quote unquote, a little more palatable with my language. I've been told that. I was invited to write an essay about Black people's response to all these Black people being killed by police. And they were policing my language in the paper. 
So in my response letter, I said, so I'm going to write about what just happened in this email exchange in the paper, because this is an example of why I have a desire to call in black to work. Oh and not my gosh. Like, you know, oh. it, it's so pervasive, <laughs> but yeah. It, I to it, it really and truly is. Yeah. It's I just used to be authentic in that moment. I was like, no, you know what? This is reality. This is the truth. Like you said. And if that means that some journals will never publish my work, so, yeah, be, it. so be it. Absolutely. So be it. Absolutely. Yeah. I would rather be authentic, authentic to myself yes. than to say, I'm going to publish your work. You know, I, 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 again, this, this brings me back to when I first started, mm -hmm. um, my background is in fashion and, um, I wanted to do research about black hair. So all the research that I've done is all about black hair. Mm -hmm. And so I was telling my mentor, who is a black woman. She was one of the very first black women in academia in the field of what we call apparel and textiles. Um, and so she was one of the first to publish very highly recognized woman. And so I'm talking to her about what I'm thinking that my line of inquiry is going to be. And she said, you know, I'm really afraid for you to do that because I want you to get tenure and promotion. Mm. And she said, why don't you just wait until after you get promoted to associate professor and you get tenure, then do research about black hair. She said, I'm afraid that because they don't value our work, they don't see our work as rigorous. They're not going to promote you and they're not going to give you tenure. Thank God that I did not listen to her. Thank God that I felt I just followed my passion and what it was that I really wanted to do. But, you know, and I know what, what she was doing. She was trying to protect me. You know, she was she was truly concerned, you know, about the fact that there's a good chance that I won't be able to make tenure if I do this kind of research. You know, she was trying to protect me, but again, mm -hmm. assimilation, right? It, it's fear. It's, yeah. it's fear. So some of this feedback that I'm sharing with you, some of it was from white people, but a lot of it was from black people, Yeah, black women and men who yeah. were to look out in various ways. And, and I think we had to tell them, I, I remember it was me and a couple other black people who we were like, we know what you're trying to do. You are trying to prevent us from experiencing the harm. That is not what we find helpful. Mm. We find helpful you dismantling in any way you can. Like I, I remember telling junior scholars under me, my mm. goal is to take every brick of this institution and dismantle anything that's standing in your way. Wow. So if you're writing about Black people is a barrier. Let me go ahead and bust right through that like, with my superpower. And I did not come out and skate, right? I mm. got a lot of rejections and pushback. And I hopped, I happily hopped my ass off the tenure track uh, because I wanted a more holistic life. But that means I just had to choose a different life for myself. And now we're creating more opportunities and avenues for people to do the work they wanted, um, rather than just trying to get us to get along to get along. Because um, mm -hmm. I was like, we can't keep doing that get along to get along because then nothing will ever really change. Because once you okay. get tenure, in a field that they will tell you, well, now you got all these service responsibilities. Now you have all these other things. You actually don't have time to publish a blackity black paper no more. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> so I was like, well, I'm a junior scholar in Hungary and I'm seeing the world unfolding as it is right now. Why on earth would I wait to talk about what is happening right now? Mm -hmm. And they wonder why scholars are called irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because being told to wait yeah return wait yeah wait. yeah well this this was one of my favorite conversations i have to say dr courtney yes. it was it was really really good and i'm praying that everybody that has been um on with us and the people that will see the recording later on um will will find some value in the conversation and so i just want to know how can the audience stay connected with you Yes, I tweet and post a lot on Instagram through my Equiwell Partners account. So that is the, the name. It's just hash at uh, Equiwell Partners. Um, I'm also super active on LinkedIn. Uh, my posts about quitting <laughs> went viral. <laughs> uh, and it, it resonated with a lot of people, apparently. Um, but it was like, yeah, just because I'm good at something doesn't mean I have to subject myself to more harm in it. So I am happy to branch out and do other things. Uh, so you can find me on there, too. Uh, and my website, too, is CourtneyLMcLooney.com. You can see all the things I'm up to. And I try to post my writings on there regularly. So that's where you can find me. And again, Dr. Tamika, thank you for creating the space. We yeah. need conversations like this, um, like you said, so that way our people are informed and aware and operating from a place of courage 
I love yeah, it. Yeah. You know, I was really nervous about doing this. Mm -hmm. um, I had some mentors of mine who, let me tell you, honey, one of my, I, if, and I always say this, if you don't have mentors in your life, you better get one. You better mm -hmm. get several. Um, I have some amazing ones in my life. And one of my mentors actually told me, because I am I was also one of those individuals who was an academic, okay. who also decided to leave my career okay. in academia to step out on my own, right? And so my mentor was asking me how things were going with my business. And I was telling her what I was doing. And she, as I'm talking to her about it, she's looking at me and she's shaking her head. And I'm like, well, why are you shaking your head at me? And she's like, because you're not living in your purpose. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you about yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I looked at her and I was like, well, what do you mean? I was like, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm doing this and that. Yeah. And she was like, she said, she called me. She said, you're like Jonah. You're in the whale. Oh, it's time for you to come out of the whale. Yes. And so my first episode on this podcast was me talking about the experience of me coming out of the whale mm. and how important that was for me to be able to do this work. Because I was, I was afraid to do this work because so many of us don't want to hear of this course. kind of conversation. So many of us are, like you said, ignorance is bliss. They're okay with assimilating because that's the easy way to go. Yeah. Right. But they don't want these kind of conversations. You yeah. know, a lot of people don't. And so I was really afraid about that. But I'm so happy that I had somebody to snap me back into reality. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. As they yeah. should. Yes. Yeah. I will forever be a forever longtime listener. And yes. so again, appreciate the opportunity to join you and look forward to more of these conversations so we can yes. again yes. all the ways they try to dim our light. And our beauty. Yes. So are you, uh, you know what? I'm going to have to reach out to you because um, there may be an opportunity for us to see each other. I'll be coming to New York if that's where you're still at. Yes, you're I still am. Right outside okay. New York. Okay. Okay. So yeah, um, I am uh, releasing a book. Um, it'll be actually released on uh, the Crown Act Day, which is July 3rd. Yes. Okay. The book is called Black Hair in a White World. Ooh. Okay. And so um, I'll be starting my uh, tour in July. And one of my first places that I'm coming to is New York. Um, so I'll be in Harlem and Brooklyn for a couple days. And so I'm, when I come, I'll make sure that I let you know so that we can connect. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Yes. Thank yeah. you so much yeah. for doing that work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. It was a, such a pleasure to meet you, Dr. Courtney. Pleasure. Yes. Thank yes. you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, my dear. Have a good night. You too. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye. So that was a dynamic conversation. Oh my gosh. Like one of my favorite that I've had so far. Um, and as you all know, I'm a researcher, I'm an educator, and it's so important that all the conversations that I have, I bring forth the research. And that's actually what this entire conversation was about, was about bringing forth that research that Dr. Courtney and her colleagues did about the white gaze. And so, um, like I said before, I'll make sure that I put all the information that she mentioned um, in the description so that you can have access to it. I'll put a link in there for their um, article so that you can have access to that. But this episode, we're going to be winding down in just a moment. This episode of the Black Beauty Activist podcast was brought to you by um, my new book that I was just mentioning, uh, available for pre-order now. Uh, through Barnes and Nobles and Amazon, Black Hair in a White World. If you have not already pre-ordered your copy, make sure that you get a copy. This book is going to be my first book that I go on tour with, and I'm ex super excited about it. If you are looking for a dynamic speaker to come to your university or come to your organization to talk about some diversity issues uh, surrounding Black hair, Black beauty, Black culture, um, I am your woman and I would love to partner with you all. Please um, connect with me. Uh, you can connect with me at info at drtamikaellington.com. And I'll make sure that I also put that in the chat or in the, um, in the description for you. So if you have enjoyed listening to this episode, which I am so hoping that you are, because this was an amazing, amazing conversation. Uh, I want you to subscribe. Please make sure that you subscribe um, onto the, the YouTube channel. So the Black Beauty Activist podcast is on YouTube. Uh, we do a live stream on Facebook and LinkedIn. And then I'm going to be uploading these um, on the Buzzsprout uh, platform so that they can get out 
uh, worldwide to lots of other uh, platforms as well. But if you enjoy, please make sure that you like, leave a comment. I see we have several comments um, that I would, I'm excited, excited to be able to read those and to be able to respond to you. And um, I wish everybody a wonderful night. Thank you so much for being with me this evening. And I look forward to seeing you all at the next episode. Peace and blessings, peace and blessings. Thank you.